Good afternoon, everyone. Congratulations, class of 2018.5. I want to thank uh, Dean Zia for the invitation to speak and for the students who uh, submitted my name. I'm so honored to be with you today. And I also just want to ask everyone to give our student speakers another round of applause for those really powerful. <laughs> incredibly powerful statements. I also want to give my thanks to the staff who are helping to coordinate this event, the student volunteers, uh, the catering team, the custodial staff, and everyone helping for the event and the reception to follow. Um, and I also am going to be echoing some of the, the themes that have been brought to the table by our speakers today, and especially amplifying some of the points that President Paxson made. So I'm thrilled to be speaking with you as a member of the Brown faculty, but also as a Brown alum. And from this perspective, I want to say thank you, especially to the families and to the friends that gave support to the students that are graduating. The lessons and guidance that I received from my family allowed me to complete my degree here at Brown and sustain my research and teaching today. So I know how important the contributions and the sacrifices of the families and friends who were here, both families that we were born into and families that we built. Um, so I want to say thank you for supporting the students. As a student preparing to leave Brown, I, uh, excuse me, as students are preparing to leave Brown, I receive a lot of questions about uh, how to move forward with life after Brown, how to start a life but also how to remain committed to social justice. And so I'm thinking about what it means to graduate in 2018 in this current political climate, which is starkly different from when I graduated from Brown. And so I have three recommendations that I can share with the students who I so moved to see some of your faces. Um, and the first is that I want you to reflect on the passions and commitments that brought you to Brown. The second is that I want you to reflect on the better world that you imagined and demanded in the turbulent years while you were on campus, especially in 2014 and 2015. And the third is that I hope that you'll find inspiration in the new Brown that you helped to make possible, which is certainly a Brown that I could only have dreamed of when I was a student. So to the first point, it takes the guidance of academic mentors to help us all navigate school, but it also takes the wisdom and life lessons of our families, biological and created, and the collective wisdom of our ancestors to help us continue. As an example, I grew up in the small town of South Texas, in Viuality of South Texas. It's a rural agrarian town just an hour east of the US-Mexico border. It's close to San Antonio, so I grew up a San Antonio Spurs fan. I also grew up in one of the poorest school districts in the state of Texas. So when I left Texas for Brown, I was thinking very critically about what my new life would be like in Rhode Island, and I was glad to be traveling here with my sister. But I was also still grieving the death of my maternal grandmother, Armandina Munoz. She moved to Texas from Mexico with her husband and their seven children in the 1950s. My mother was the youngest, she was six months old. And when I was growing up, my grandmother took care of me while my parents worked. We called her Mama Grande, or just Mama for short. Near the end of her life, Mama suffered from Alzheimer's. And during the afternoons that I spent with her as a teenager before I left for Brown, we would sit on her couch or on her porch swing, and she would hold my hand, and she told me stories about growing up in Mexico. That summer, in the more advanced stages of her illness, she only repeated three stories. The first was the fantastically romantic story of how she met my grandfather. She remembered that they made eye contact at a dance in town, but that they didn't dare speak, and of course they didn't dance. <laughs> they exchanged letters for months before they ever exchanged a word, but they eventually fell in love and they married. The second story was not romantic. Mama described people living in northern Mexico in the border towns that she grew up in, people that couldn't read and couldn't write. Instead of signing their full names, they had to sign documents by marking an X on paper. She described men coming in from working in the field with produce, standing in long lines, and drawing an X to indicate that they had been paid for their work, for the crops that they had harvested. The third story she repeated day after day, while she was holding my hand, was a story of her crying at home when she was a young girl because she couldn't go to school. When Mama was nine years old, her mother became ill, and she, the youngest daughter, had to quit school. She told me that she cried because she wanted to finish school, but bound by tradition in her mother's illness, she stayed home. 
This last memory in particular made her relive the long regret that she had never been able to become a teacher, never had the opportunity to teach others to write their own name or to read. Recalling these memories, she would pat my hand and whisper, que triste, que triste. For her, teaching was a vocation, and she believed that through education, people can transform their lives. But more, she believed that through education, societies can be transformed. And when she had children that were growing up during the civil rights movement of the 60s and 70s in the United States, she supported their efforts to fight for social justice. She didn't discourage my mother from walking out of Uvalde High School in 1970, or my aunt from running a newspaper that powerfully cr critiqued labor exploitation, segregation, disenfranchisement, discrimination. My mother and father walked out of their high school in protest of conditions that they suffered, including segregation, many years after Brown versus Board, and being denied the right to have access to bilingual education. But they were also walking out not only to change their conditions, but also for the generations that would follow, for me and for my sister, and so that we would have a chance one day to go to college. What my parents or my grandparents couldn't have known was that in 1968, there were students at Brown of the same generation that were also putting their scholarships and their grades and their college applications on, on the line when they walked out to demand change here at Brown. They could not have anticipated that, thou, that while they were in Uvalde fighting for equality in schools, that there were students here in Providence, Rhode Island, making sure that when I was ready to come to Brown U University, the university would be open to me too. Students in 68 and 75 and in the 80s and the 90s did important critical work, like establishing the Third World Center and the concentration in ethnic studies. These were life sources for me at Brown. My grandmother's stories and the history of student activism taught me a few things that I brought with me to Brown. The first thing that I learned from my grandmother's memories was that you have to surround yourself with love and laughter. These are the emotions that are not only key to building resiliency, but in the dark times, they bring us light. The second is that when you see injustice, you have to call it out. You have to be an agent of change. It's the injustice that we see that we aren't able to change that never leaves us. And second, what I learned from my parents and the stories of student activism that I learned about uh, growing up and then eventually here at Brown is that universities, schools of higher education are not utopian institutions. They too need reform. When students work for change, they are anticipating students that will come behind them. They are creating possibilities that others will be able to thrive because of their efforts. So I hope that's something that motivated me when I came to Brown, to figure out how I could be an agent of change when I was here, and it's something that I've carried with me as a faculty member. But in addition to what I, I brought with me to Brown, I hope that you'll remember the better world that you imagined while you were students here and the kinds of demands that you made in the turbulent years between 2014 and 2015. We need to remember the better world that you imagined now more than ever. We are living in a moment when civil and human rights are being pulled apart and stretched and are reaching a breaking point. And yet, we should have no illusions that the democracy that existed in October 6, 2016 was ideal or perfect. We are living then as we are living, we are living, we were living then as we are living now as people divided in drastically different worlds. In 2014 and 2015, black and Latinx children were shot and killed by police officers. Private prisons were holding immigrant children in detention. These detention centers were at capacity then, as they are now. Undocumented students lived in fear then, too. We know that the world that we inhabited then was not an ideal of full freedom. The institutions of our nation can be pulled until they crumble, although that's unlikely, I think. What is more likely is that they will be pulled apart, maybe only to snap back into the form, into the imperfect shape of democracy as it existed in October 2016 or the institutions can be molded into something new. I hope we can strive for something new. I believe everyone in this room is capable of making that happen because you are able to make institutional change at a place like Brown, an elite private institution, a university that was made possible by the acquisition of land following a period of native genocide, a university that was made possible by dollars accumulated from the transatlantic slave trade. But thanks to you, and the students that came before you, 
The Brown University that welcomed you through the Van Wickle Gates is not the same Brown University that is cheering your accomplishments today. So let's just think about some of the advances that you uh, helped to bring to campus just very quickly that I've seen as I rejoined faculty. I feel like I'm graduating with you because I, I joined faculty in 2014. Brown University now celebrates Indigenous Peoples Day thanks to the contributions and the hard work of students, faculty, and staff at Brown. Students receive support from the First Generation College and Low Income Center, and the Fly Center also provides institutional support for undocumented students on campus. The services for students that need support for mental health are now greatly expanded to meet student need. The Title IX office is helping to find solutions for sexual assault and gender equity on campus. The university not only has a diversity and inclusion action plan, but academic departments and administrative departments have action plans of their own so that we can measure improvement. In spring 2019, students, faculty, and staff will celebrate the long contributions of pioneering African-American students at Brown when they walk by and spend time in the newly named Paige Robinson Hall. These institutional changes didn't come merely because progress comes naturally or with time. These changes that I've seen arrived because you helped inspire that change. Or we can be a little bit more honest and say, because you demanded the change. While you were at Brown, you helped organize critical conversations. You built coalitions across gender, race, class, religion, citizenship status. You wrote manifestos, organized demonstrations, and even occupied buildings. But students did more than just make demands. They answered an enormous call from President Paxson. On November 19, 2015, President Paxson invited members of the Brown community to contribute to the University Diversity, Diversity Inclusion and Action Plan. The university was open to honest assessment and asked for concrete actions that Brown needed to take to make it a more inclusive and diverse university. It was a daunting task, but it was an invitation and an opportunity. The changes that we see today resulted from students, faculty, staff, alumni, and the administration seizing that opportunity. In the midst of a long semester and over a holiday break, we made concrete recommendations. Students and faculty collaborated on Google Docs. Students had long work sessions. It was an enormous investment of our intellectual and economic, excuse me, intellectual and emotional energy. I know that I can read the DAP published in 2016 and see sentences that I drafted, included in that document, and now manifesting in change in campus. I see centers and programs that exist because of the recommendations of students sitting in this room, in these rows. As a historian, part of what I admired was that the students turned to the history of race at Brown to shape their recommendations. They were scholars in the study of how to make institutional change. They studied the history of the university and they studied the history of student movements and protests at Brown. And after reading the manifestos of students that came before them and earlier diversity and inclusion action plans, the students made concrete recommendations. We still have a long way to go before Brown University is the university that we dream it can be. We have an incredibly long way to go before we live in a world Regard, where regardless of citizenship, status, class, gender, sexuality, religion, or race, people can live in peace, surrounded by love and light, and not injustice. But what you help to start here at Brown is nothing short of monumental. When we remember that this university is built on land that belonged to the Wabanong and Narragansett tribes, and that the university grew from families that profited from the transatlantic slave trade, when we remember that those are Brown's roots too, within that context, I hope you all can appreciate the truly remarkable contributions that you made for Brown. You continued the work of many that came before you and for the many that will follow you. So to conclude, let me quickly say that I hope that you remember what you were dreaming of before 2016. I hope that when you see injustice, you will call it out and be an agent of change. It's the injustice that we see that we aren't able to change that never leaves us. I hope that you will surround yourselves with love and laughter to stay resilient. And I hope that you'll find inspiration in what you've already accomplished here at Brown. When you see an opportunity to make change, take it because they don't come often. Keep imagining and building a better world. 
I know that my grandmother, Mama Grande, would be so proud of you. And I know that I have been inspired by you. Felicidades y mil gracias. Congratulations and a million thanks.